Number 10. Poison Gas Island In Japan, there's a horrifying place called Poison Gas Island. Its real name is Okunoshima, and it was once an isolated island used by the Japanese to manufacture poison gas. It's sort of a no-brainer on why you don't want to visit this island, right? The poison gas was then used in the war against China. The Japanese actually used this gas to perpetrate war crimes. During World War II, the Imperial Japanese Army took the island and turned it into a massive gas factory to help them fight chemical warfare against their enemies. At the time, there were about 6,700 people working and living on the island, manufacturing poison gas 24 hours a day. When a documentary team working with the Tokyo Broadcasting System recently visited the island to do a story on it, they came across a man named Yasuma Fujimoto. Fujimoto was 91 years old at the time of filming. He told the documentary crew that even today, he remembers the exact chemical equation for the poison gas that he helped manufacture. After the war, the Japanese government was quick to cover up the atrocities they committed. All evidence on the island was destroyed and the poison gas factory was torn down. As of now, the island is home to around 700 wild rabbits. The Japanese have also changed its name to Rabbit Island in an attempt to distort the island's ugly past. Number 9. The Soviet's Germ Island There's an abandoned island that was once a secret testing ground used by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It's called Vazrajdania Island, and the Soviets used it to test extremely dangerous pathogens that they could have potentially used to devastate huge populations of people. The island itself is surrounded by miles of desert. It used to be home to a small community of fishermen who lived off the beautiful, clean, completely natural lagoon. But now the fish are dead, the desert is toxic and polluted, and the island is home to the remnants of carcinogenic pesticides. What used to be one of the most naturally abundant areas in the region of the Aral Sea is now a polluted hellscape. The island has been abandoned for the last 20 years, though nobody has really tried to do anything with it since then. The truth is that it's not even an island anymore. It's actually 10 times larger today than it used to be because all the rivers that used to feed the lagoon have been diverted to irrigate cotton fields. The island is now a peninsula, one of the deadliest peninsulas on the planet. Because of the Soviet germ testing, which was basically the Russians researching the deadliest possible biological weapons, the whole area is potentially infected with anthrax spores. In fact, the BBC recently reported that the leftover anthrax spores can live here in the dirt for hundreds of years, meaning the island will probably never be occupied again. Number 8. Heart Island Heart Island in New York City is one of the most disturbing places in all of North America. During the coronavirus pandemic, burials at the public cemetery on Heart Island increased from 24 a week to 24 a day. This was hardly Heart Island's first rodeo. The small island situated in the Long Island Sound just beside the Bronx was used starting back in 1869 to dispose of people who died from all kinds of diseases, though primarily tuberculosis. Ever since then, the island has been used as a kind of dumping ground for dead people who were never claimed by family members. In other words, it's an island of the forgotten. The history of the island is actually quite interesting. According to National Geographic, New York City purchased the land in 1868 and cleared 45 acres for the cemetery. The city needed it so that they had somewhere to bury people who couldn't afford their own funerals. Since then, an estimated one million people have been buried on the island. Unfortunately, it's impossible to say for certain because a fire broke out in the 1970s and destroyed all the records. Plus, there used to be widespread reuse of graves with people just kind of dumping bodies wherever they could. Number 7. Fort Carroll Island Fort Carroll Island is located near the Key Bridge in Baltimore. It's a forbidden fortress right on the harbor that's been a no-go zone for pedestrians for decades. If you try to go anywhere near the island, you'll be confronted by all kinds of warning signs advising you not to go any further. But what makes this island so dangerous? The answer is that there's nothing dangerous at all on the island. It's simply an abandoned fortress home to squadrons of seagulls. Are they evil seagulls? No, but there's enough of them to make you extremely uneasy. Oh yes, and there are hordes and hordes of hungry rats. It's not the most pleasant island to visit. The fortress on the island was originally built to defend against attacks from the sea in 1814, but by the time it was complete, it was already considered outdated. It was finished around 1848, but the locals never really used it for much. Once the fortress was complete, it was almost immediately abandoned. It has since sat in limbo, not being used for much of anything. The Coast Guard set up a pistol firing range for a bit, some people have tried to turn the island into a prison or a mental hospital, but all these years later, it's simply a forbidden island that nobody is allowed to visit. Number 6. Closed for Business Nihau is one of the islands in Hawaii that you will never visit. Even most Hawaiians who live on other islands have never stepped foot on the Nihau. 
It's been privately owned for around 150 years, completely off limits to tourists and outsiders. It was purchased by a woman named Elizabeth McHutchinson Sinclair back in 1864. Guess how much she paid for it? She paid the ruler of Hawaii at the time, King Kamehameha V, $10,000 in gold. She also made a vow that she would preserve the island for traditional Hawaiian culture. All these years later, her descendants are still honoring that promise. In 1915, Elizabeth's grandson, Aubrey Robinson, closed the island off to visitors. Then, Aubrey's own grandsons kept up the tradition by shielding the 170 natives on the island from modern technology. The islanders who live here still fish and hunt, they still use knives and spears, and they still speak their original dialect. There's absolutely no contact allowed between outsiders and the indigenous population. The only way you can even look at this island is by taking a helicopter tour, with the helicopter simply flying over the island to give you a bird's eye view. Would you like to take a helicopter tour on the island? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 5. Farallon Islands The Farallon Islands off the coast of San Francisco are almost never visited. In total, there are four groups of islands here spanning about 211 acres. Amazingly, the islands are only about 28 miles, 45 kilometers from the coast. But you can't really see them from San Francisco, as they're almost always hidden behind a dense veil of clouds and fog. The only way to visit the islands is by going on a boat tour, though you're not going to actually step foot on land. Instead, you can usually see dozens of whales, dozens of sharks, and other terrifying creatures that would make getting in the water a voluntary death sentence. In fact, it's not the islands here that are dangerous, but the waters that surround them. Even as recently as 2012, a racing yacht was destroyed when it ran into hidden rocks and capsized. And then there are the legends from the Native Americans who refer to the Farallon Islands as the Islands of the Dead. They were simply too dangerous to sail anywhere near. But besides just being dangerous, the islands are forbidden because Teddy Roosevelt turned them into national protected areas. It's completely prohibited to set foot on any of the Farallon Islands. Number 4. Volcano Island Surtsey is a volcanic island just a few miles from the coast of Iceland. It's one of the newest islands in the world, formed by a series of volcanic eruptions that happened between 1963 and 1967. What's really pretty cool about the volcanic islands is that it's been protected ever since it was created. Thanks to the Icelandic government, Surtsey is one of the only places in the world with pristine natural beauty where humans have never been able to bother the local life. A lot of interesting stuff has been happening here since 1967. Scientists have been able to watch how islands evolve. They've witnessed birds dropping seeds, which then helped to grow mold and bacteria. Within a decade, 10 different plant species were living on the island. But by 2004, there were over 60. Today, there are 89 bird species who visit the island regularly, as well as 335 species of invertebrates who call the island home. Naturally, the island must remain forbidden so that researchers can continue observing the literal birth of a new landmass. Number 3. Snake Island if you haven't heard of the terrifying Brazilian island overrun with snakes, you're in for a treat. In Portuguese, the island is called Ilha de Queimada Grande, but we'll just call it Snake Island. It's home to not only one of the deadliest snakes in the world, but also the most endangered. The islands located 90 miles, 145 kilometers from the coast of Sao Paulo, looking like any other island. But it's unlike anywhere else in the world, because it's infested with up to 4,000 golden lancehead vipers. These vipers are specialized killers, their venom is so potent that if you're bit, you'll die in less than an hour. Anyone who accidentally wanders onto Snake Island is left dead in a pool of their own blood. But what's really amazing is that from between 1909 and 1920, a small family did live on the island to operate its lighthouse. Unfortunately for the family, their tenure came to an end when a group of snakes slithered through one of their windows one night and decided to sink their fangs in. The island evolved to be the perfect habitat for these vipers over thousands of years. When the sea levels rose 11,000 years ago, the island was isolated from the mainland. The snakes then took a unique path along the evolutionary road. They adapted to eating birds that land on the island. Their venom must be potent so that the birds are paralyzed immediately upon being bitten. This has given them venom about five times stronger than similar snakes on the mainland. Number 2. Maori Island UFOs Maori Island is located in the Puget Sound near Seattle. While it's not technically forbidden, it was the scene of a very peculiar incident said to have occurred on June 21, 1947. Private pilot Kenneth Arnold was patrolling east of the island when he allegedly witnessed a string of nine unidentified flying objects speeding past Mount Rainier at an impossible 1,200 miles, 1,900 kilometers an hour. 
At the time, the story gained international fame as one of the first major UFO sightings. It was actually this sighting that spawned the term flying saucer. At the same time that Kenneth Arnold witnessed the UFO, a man named Harold Dahl, who was in his patrol boat near Maori Island, saw the same thing. He reported six aircrafts shaped like donuts speeding through the sky, with his account being corroborated by his two crewmen and his 15-year-old son who was on the boat with him. We don't know why the UFOs were at Maori Island that day, or to be honest if they were ever there at all. The FBI investigated the case and concluded that the sightings were a hoax. But then again, isn't that just what you'd expect the FBI to say when it comes to aliens? Number 1. Macquarie Island Macquarie Island is located about halfway between Tasmania and Antarctica. It was used as a halfway point in the early 1900s to establish radio links between Australia and expeditions heading to the South Pole. Since 1948, there's been a permanent research base established here. But don't worry, you'll never see it. Macquarie Island is completely forbidden. Unless you're a scientist sent here to do research, you'll never get anywhere near it. And this is for good reason. 200 years ago, explorers brought rabbits, rats, and mice to the island. They ended up overwhelming the indigenous creatures that lived here, then spread across the island and procreated like crazy. It took researchers until 2014 to eradicate the invasive species, and only now is the island returning to its natural glory. If they even let one pesky tourist on the island, all that work could be for nothing. Number 10. Missile Base, Negron, Latvia Throughout the world, many abandoned facilities from the Cold War era sit untouched. Cold War era bunkers such as the Missile Base Negron in Latvia can be found scattered across the former Soviet Union. During the Cold War, many countries like Latvia built bunkers as a way to prepare for any potential nuclear attacks. While there's no longer any open threat of nuclear war, the site remains. Around 1961, the site was used for storing early generation Chusovaya missiles. And after its final closure in 1982, the monumental bunkers which were used in the Cold War era have now been preserved and turned into a historical site. During the Cold War, both the U.S. government and the former USSR built bunkers, weapons, and labs for sustaining the upcoming potential nuclear war. When the threat of nuclear war cooled, many of these projects were shelved. There's a reason why missile silos and missile sites are considered national treasures in many of these places. They were amongst the most expensive and sophisticated pieces of military architecture ever created. These items are still being found in the missile base in Negrand. Number 9. Titan II ICBM Base Museum, Saharita, Arizona You can visit the Titan II ICBM Base Museum in Saharita, Arizona to see a launch control center that was used during the Cold War. During the Cold War period, the American government built hundreds of these underground missile launch centers across the country. The Titan II is one prime example. Extensive renovations were needed at the launch control center to prepare it for public display. The command center is housed in its own underground bunker, and in order to keep the complex functioning, the control center has its own generators, water supply, and air filtration systems. It was also made more complete with its own environmental controls, light sensors, as well as a security system. The engineers who designed the control center were aware of the possibility that a nuclear explosion could occur near the craft, so they designed this military equipment to withstand the effects of a nuclear blast by making it mobile, with the ability to move around instead of fixed to the ground. It was suspended inside a much bigger casing. During the Cold War, the U.S. used the advantage of the Titan II missile base to theoretically allow it to survive a nuclear attack with second strike chances. While some people saw the weapons as a way of deterring an attack, others believed these weapons might provoke an attack. This was a large part of the whole arms race that the Cold War consisted of. Even before the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, between 1970 and 1986, Many of these missile sites slash control centers were converted into museums. Number 8, S-25 and A-35, Radom's Narofomenisk, Russia. Oftentimes, Cold War relics are fascinating to look at, though much of the infrastructure built to support them, however, has fallen out of use and is decaying. One example of this, the Radom's can be found in Russia. Several abandoned anti-missile defense system radar domes still stand today in the narrow Fomenisk area of Russia. A surveillance tower also stands empty, abandoned, in the birch forest outside Moscow. The monument is made up of six radomes and eight silos. These large spherical buildings acted as an early warning system for potential nuclear attacks on Moscow and have stood since the 1950s. 
These radomes were designed to track and intercept any incoming missiles. In the event of a nuclear attack, the early warning radars would detect the missiles and signal to air command centers. Today, they are a sobering reminder of the links both sides went to in building massive anti-nuclear defense structures. Number 7. Soviet M4 Bomber Jets, Ingles, Saratov, Russia The Bison, or M4 Bomber, was one of the most feared military weapons during the Cold War. The aircraft was also the largest model during the war, weighing 80 tons. When the Soviet Union first displayed their M4 model to the public in Red Square in 1954, the United States was surprised and concerned. They had been unable to intercept any prior knowledge that the Soviets had even built a jet bomber prior to the unveiling, and it led them to scramble to commission jet bombers of their own. Later, however, intelligence revealed that the bomber's range wouldn't allow it to attack the U.S. and return to the USSR. Although it was created during the Cold War to attack U.S. targets, the original model wasn't widely used, and the following version of the bomber was retired in 1994. A handful of them can still be found in Saratov, Russia. At the beginning of the Cold War, many countries commissioned an array of large fighter jets like the M4 Bison because the sky was a major component of both their defense and attack strategies. However, once this period ended, the other major components of the defense strategy were not changed and it became clear that these jet designs were something they could bring into the future. The Bison was just the second Soviet bomber built to carry nuclear bombs after America's B-52. Both the B-52 and the M-4 were some of the first jet bombers to use smart electronics, radar, and other cutting-edge technologies. They were also the first aircraft that had a pressurized cabin and nose turret designed to transport nuclear bombs all over the world. Number 6. Hanford Site, Richland, Washington, USA This site was used for the Manhattan Project, and plutonium was produced here long before the Cold War began. The area is 568 square miles in size. As the weaponry race with the USSR progressed, the U.S. government added new reactors to its energy program. The then-president, John F. Kennedy himself, even made a special trip to dedicate a reactor project. By the time the Cold War ended, the Energy Department had produced massive amounts of nuclear waste and decades later, in 1989, the U.S. Department of Energy embarked on an era of cleanup and transformation for the area. This was an aim to transform the site into a global hub for clean energy technologies. Although the end of the Cold War has removed the reason for many of these expensive projects, the government continues to work on them arguing that other reasons like energy security, advances in science and technology, and improved relationships with other countries justify the projects. Known as one of the most toxic sites in the United States, Hanford contains obscene amounts of radioactive waste that was created as a result of the production of nuclear weapons, making it an incredibly dangerous place to be. Cleanup attempts are difficult and ongoing. Number 5. The Fed's Cold War Bunker Culpepper Switch Washington. The Culpeper switch was intended to keep the Federal Reserve operational in the event that Washington was wiped out in a nuclear war. Pretty smart, right? While several full-scale nuclear war simulations played out in the 1950s, it wasn't until 1962 that researchers came up with an actual design for how the country's central bank would survive a war. The Culpeper switch was one of them. Even some politicians from the Cold War era thought the bunker was silly. In 1969, the compound was built outside Culpeper, Virginia, near Mount Pony. The building was originally known as the Federal Reserve's Communications and Record Center and had about 135,000 square feet of space when it opened in 1972 and held close to $4 billion in American currency during the 70s. During the war, if there were a nuclear attack by Russia, the bank would have to be able to communicate with others even if the phone lines were down. The Culpeper switch was one of several highly secure bunkers that the U.S. used during the Cold War. Recently declassified documents revealed that the Culpeper switch used a groundbreaking internet protocol. After the end of World War II, now that America was safe from bomb attacks, the government no longer needed large warehouses to store physical money. Do you think that the U.S. no longer makes use of bunkers and Federal Reserve storage facilities like the Culpeper switch? Or do you think there may still be active fail-safes in place? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more awesome content. Number 4. The JFK Bunker, Peanut Island A list like this isn't complete without former American President John F. Kennedy's bunker, a little-known remnant from the Cold War era. 
Like many other presidents and world leaders during this fraught period, Kennedy had a bunker installed under the White House to prepare for possible nuclear attacks. There was also said to be a fallout shelter in his backyard. In addition to these precautions, there was also Pina Island, a tiny island in the intercoastal area in Palm Beach, Florida, across the waterway from the Kennedy family's Palm Beach Island estate. If the presidential family had been visiting their Florida home and were in need of escape in the case of a nuclear attack, the family would also be able to access this bunker by escaping in a submarine. It is a powerful reminder of the buildup of nuclear missiles during the time leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The bunker was constructed quickly and secretly to protect the president and his family. Located in a forest and underground, the facilities were left abandoned until it was restored by the museum in 1999. The preserved bunker looks almost exactly as it did in 1961 when it was built. One strange missing feature? Though meant to house the president and his family in the event of a nuclear attack, the bunker did not include any toilet facilities. Yikes! From a distance, the bunker looks like a giant dollhouse squatting atop a large gray drum that runs underground into the lake. Owned by Palm Beach County, currently after a dispute with the museum's proprietors, the bunker facilities aren't very well known. Though the surrounding sandbars and camping areas on one part of the small island are popular boating party spots for the locals in bikinis and board shorts. Number 3. Plot M. Willow Springs, Illinois. If the average American's awareness of the dangers of nuclear waste as a form of contamination had been as high as it is now, some Cold War relics might have been more carefully stored. This hunk of stone looks like a tombstone, but there is nothing buried here. The gravestone is located at the site of the former Argonne National Laboratory. The stone, which once stopped radioactivity from coming into contact with air, was made of graphite and uranium. In addition to the stone, you'll also find a number of other reminders of the lab's past, including a few other concrete inscriptions with historical details. They were once experimental nuclear reactors located in the lab during the Cold War era. These laboratories were also used for testing bomb materials. While the actual laboratories that were operational during then are now abandoned, they left behind lots of radioactive waste that remains dangerous. No matter whether you're a government official, a student, a passerby, or a scientist, you should probably avoid digging into that old burial area. There's an extremely high risk of contamination. Number 2. The Greenbrier Bunker, West Virginia While the Greenbrier Bunker isn't technically abandoned, it was never used for its originally intended purpose and now has become both a historical landmark and resort. Back in 1955, American President Eisenhower asked the Department of Defense to come up with an emergency protocol for Congress to follow in the event of a potential nuclear strike on the capital of Washington, D.C. Even if the entire city was destroyed, there would need to be plans in place to keep the government able to function. So, a nuclear bunker that could safely house all 535 members of Congress and a convenient location that was close enough to escape but far enough away to avoid the fallout was chosen. The place? A luxury resort located in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Greenbrier was chosen because it had previously served as both a World War II internment facility and later as a military hospital. Now, tourists can schedule a tour of the former bunker as well as stay in the resort. Number 1. The X-10 Graphite Reactor, Tennessee Located at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the X-10 Graphite Reactor is one of the first nuclear reactor sites built, originally a part of the Manhattan Project in World War II. It was actually the world's second artificial nuclear reactor. It was continuously active for many years and during peacetime was used for several purposes including hospital grade nuclear activities. However, the site was shut down in November of 1963 and designated a National Historic Landmark. While it is no longer active, it is not completely abandoned, and tourists today can check out the control room and reactor face through tours offered by the American Museum of Science and Energy. Number 10. SS Airfield. Check out this incredible abandoned ship, part boat and part forest. The SS Airfield hasn't been operational since 1972, and it's pretty clear to see. The rusted remains were left in Homebush Bay, which is part of Sydney, Australia. A lot of it's been taken for scrap, but what's left has been taken over by nature. The vessel was launched in the UK back in 1911. For some reason, the name was changed from SS Coromol to SS Airfield back in 1912. We thought it was unlucky to change the name of a ship, 
Initially a steam collier or cargo ship transporting material like coal, it became part of World War II as a supply vessel. Having managed to avoid being sunk during the conflict, it ended its days at Homebush Bay. The bay itself used to be a hive of activity for breaking up ships until toxic waste leaked into the water. Everything's cleaned up now, but the SS airfield remains a symbol of former glories. If you think it looks lonely out there, don't worry. There are three other abandoned freighters close by to keep it company. By the way, in case you're wondering, those are mangrove trees growing on the ship there. Mother Nature has turned this hunk of metal into something natural and beautiful. Would you like to see it in person? Number 9. Winchester House Now, when you think of California, probably the last thing that springs to mind is a Victorian mansion. However, living proof exists in the form of the Winchester House in San Jose. This is no ordinary mansion. It was never completed, and in fact it was constantly being built with no end in sight. By the time the owner, Sarah Winchester, died, it was an epic 24,000 square feet, 2,230 square meters. To begin with, the property was a farmhouse composed of just eight rooms. Mrs. Winchester arrived there in the late 19th century to start a new life. She'd lost her baby daughter and her husband, both through illness. Her husband was none other than William Wirt Winchester, who'd made his fortune as a household name through the gun market. So when Sarah Winchester bought the farmhouse, it's safe to say money was no object. Good job, too, as this project just kept on going. Mrs. Winchester's bizarre dream home eventually had 160 rooms, including six kitchens, 17 chimneys, and 47 staircases just to get about the place. Well, it is seven stories, after all. Crazy, right? Some of the architecture famously makes no sense, and other part of it are regarded as highly innovative. The final price tag is equivalent to $71 million today. What was the reasoning behind Sarah Winchester's desire to create this insane mansion? Sadly, she died in 1922, taking her secrets to the grave. It's thought she could have been driven by supernatural forces. You may have seen the movie starring Helen Mirren, which turned the scenario into a big screen horror. You can take tours through the house today, but at your own avail. People say it's extremely haunted. Number 8. St. Nicholas Church Bell Tower, Kaliazin. What's that sticking out of the water there? Why would someone put up a tower in the middle of a lake? Oh wait, the tower was there before the lake. You see, the St. Nicholas Church looks like an island, but it's actually the bell tower of a historic pair of monasteries in the town of Kaliazin, Russia. So the monasteries are underwater, along with the rest of the town. But why? The answer is progress. Leader Joseph Stalin wanted a new reservoir, meaning the place had to be flooded to make that happen. How deep is the water? Some areas are shallow, but in other areas the depth is 23 meters, 75 feet. The bell tower itself rises up to 75 meters, 246 feet. As you can imagine, it's a great attraction and draws everyone from tourists to swimmers and even religious figures. Yes, despite being largely submerged, the 15th and 16th century site is still visited by boat for ceremonies. Though you have to bring your own prayer books. The place has been deserted for decades. Number 7. Eastern State Penitentiary The Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia may look totally broken down now, but back in the day this creepy place was regarded as an architectural marvel. Of course, it was also a prison. Apparently, the place was built to make inmates feel as regretful and awful as possible. Construction began in 1822 with the emphasis on solitary confinement and getting offenders to think about what they'd done. This was a new approach back then, though it had also been used as the old Walnut Street Jail, also in Philly. It came from the Quakers and their way of doing things. The structure was ahead of its time, boasting running water and central heating. Even the president didn't have those. Eastern State Penitentiary is also known for housing some of the country's most famous criminals. Al Capone was just one of them. Also spending time behind bars here, murderer Frida Frost, bank robber Slick Willie Sutton and Morris Bulber, aka the rabbi, who was part of a group that encouraged women to kill their husbands and grab the insurance money. Bulber was a spiritualist who also practiced black magic, though he appears to have been appreciative of his time at the prison. Number 6. Bunker 42 the Cold War comes alive in Moscow thanks to an underground museum that used to be a 1950s nuclear bunker. The epic communication center covered 7,000 square meters and is found 65 meters, 213 feet below in the vicinity of Tagansky Metro Station. The place was top secret, but staff accessed the center through a secret train network. Two tunnels joined the bunker to the regular world of commuters and railway workers. Until the beginning of the 21st century, the public were unaware of what became known as Bunker 42's existence. This was the place where around 600 people could hunker down in the event of a potential nuclear strike from the United States. 
The tunnel network is 600 meters long, and the center was supplied with enough food and drink to keep going for 30 days if cut off. The bunker even had its own water supply in the form of a well. In 2006, the area was bought by private hands in an auction in 2006. The purchase price, a cool $65 million. Visitors can go and explore this part of Russia's secret history for themselves. This is a fascinating and frightening glimpse into the past. Are you a history buff? Would you check this place out? Let us know in the comments below and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 5. Cherokee Nuclear Plant Our next crazy abandoned place is the Cherokee Nuclear Plant in South Carolina. It may not seem that strange looking at first, but it is highly unusual. You see, it never actually got to be a nuclear plant in the first place. It's best known today for being the location for a James Cameron movie. The original idea was to build a plant with three reactors, costing billions of dollars. Unfortunately for company Duke Energy, the economy was working against them and they had to leave one reactor part finished in the early 1980s. So it looked like the Cherokee plant would rust away and be forgotten about. But a Hollywood director had other ideas. In the late 1980s, James Cameron arrived to shoot his sci-fi epic, The Abyss. The production team turned two parts of the location into underwater environments. They did this by modifying the plant's turbine pit so it could hold an astonishing 2.2 million gallons of the wet stuff. They then went even bigger by filling the reactor chamber's containment vessel with 7.5 million gallons. The movie was set deep in the ocean, so it looks like no expense was spared to recreate that vibe for the actors. In fact, things were so intense that people needed to decompress. Once Cameron and his crew moved on, the plant stood there abandoned till 2007, when it was demolished. Number 4. Mounsel Sea Forts The next abandoned place was constructed for military purposes, but at the same time could be described as groovy. How come? Keep watching to find out about Mansell Sea Forts out in the Thames estuary off Kent, England. When the structures went up, they were intended for serious business. If an enemy aircraft was spotted overhead, the flyers would find themselves being peppered with anti-aircraft fire from the forts. A fearsome opponent indeed, though it must have been pretty scary, sticking out in such an exposed position when shooting bullets at Nazis. By the end of the 1950s, the forts had done their duty and were stood down. It was then that a very different group of people moved in. The swinging cats of the growing pirate radio industry saw the leftover defense posts as a perfect place to set up shop and spin some discs. Taking a cue from the likes of Radio Caroline, who took to the water on a ship, DJs hung out at Mounsel Forts and kept the nation entertained from this unlikely makeshift studio. There's a lot more to the history of Mounsel Forts, too. They've had some truly interesting inhabitants. One fort named Ruff's Tower is now the location of the Principality of Sealand. While the forts were built to defend national pride, Sealand is its very own micronation. We don't think the military could have foreseen this incredible development. On screen, the forts have featured in some classic TV shows such as Doctor Who, plus a U2 music video and other productions. They're not exactly abandoned, we guess, but when the military left, they became used by all manner of interesting people. Number 3. The Underwater City of Xi Cheng Back in 2001, a dive was organized to check out the ancient Chinese city of Xi Cheng. Some 600 years old, it was populated during the Ming and Qing dynasties. The city, whose Mandarin name means either Lion City or alternatively Lion's Gate, made way for a hydropower station in 1959. Not that Xi Qing stopped standing once the floodgates were open. Divers were no doubt delighted to find that everything down there, around 40 meters, 131 feet below the water, was in pretty good condition. Turns out getting a dunking can be an excellent way of preserving the past for these ancient landmarks. Such is the city's watery reputation that it's called China's Atlantis. Though unlike that destination, it's very much available for viewing. Covering a distance of half a square kilometer, 500,000 square meters, it features 265 beautifully made arches together with five gates allowing access to the city. Reportedly, hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated so this amazing location could be flooded. Which is a shame, but on this evidence, the architecture has lasted longer underwater than it would have done had the city remained on dry land. It's crazy how the natural world works sometimes. Number 2. Pripyat The name Chernobyl is forever associated with the terrible nuclear disaster of 1986. After huge amounts of radiation were released into Ukraine, the area became one giant exclusion zone. One place that was totally devastated was Pripyat, the city next door to Chernobyl which was built in 1970. The idea was that Pripyat would prosper from the Chernobyl plant, with its workers living in the new city. That all changed after the fateful events of April 25, 1986. 
The power station and those inside were caught up in a series of explosions, which happened when a huge power surge hit the reactor. Pripyat lay just 1.8 miles, 3 kilometers away, and needed to be cleared very quickly. It took four hours to get close to 50,000 people out of harm's way. Today, Pripyat is a classic example of a ghost town. Images show an eerie reminder of the place that people called home. With virtually no time to prepare, much was left behind. The remnants range from buildings to an amusement park that never even had the chance to open. A Ferris wheel and bumper cars have sat there for the past 30 years or so, and they'll no doubt continue to sit there. A conservative estimate as to when people can go back to Pripyat is 24,000 years. Number 1. Japanese Sewers Jikans, as it's known, is close to Tokyo and began life in 1992. The sewer system is located 164 feet 50 meters underground. What does it ultimately do? The powerful turbines can shift huge amounts of water to a nearby river in the event of torrential rain causing a flood. So it's a potential lifesaver in the event of a natural disaster. The tunnels down there run to 4 miles 6.4 kilometers long, with the site hosting 5 silos and an enormous water tank. This tank stands at a reported height of 82 feet, 25 meters, and is 256 feet, 78 meters wide. It's regarded as amongst the most complex sewer systems on the planet, and it's not difficult to see why. There are 59 pillars connected to 10 pumps that are capable of pumping 200 tons of water per second into the river Edogawa. Thanks for watching. Are there any crazy abandoned places you think we should have included on the list? Let us know in the comments down below. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.